Members, we're going to start the meeting now, and we're going to start with the agenda item one, notice of recording stroke webcast. Can I remind members that this meeting is will be webcast for live or subsequent broadcast via the council's meeting YouTube site, that the members of the press stroke public may record and take photographs, except where there are confidential or exempt items. Agenda item two is apologies. Any apologies, Jen? Uh, Councillor Brewer, Councillor Wood, and Councillor Khan. Thank you. And agenda item three is declaration of interest. Can I remind members that they must declare all relevant pecuniary and other legislative interests arising from any business to be discussed at this meeting? And if a disclosable pecuniary interest is declared, a member must not participate in any discussion or vote on the matter and must not, re must not remain in the room unless they have been granted a dispensation. If anybody has got interest to declare, fine. If not, then we can move on. And agenda item four is action notes and action tracker. Can we agree the action notes of the meeting held on 12th of January, 2023 and note action tracker? Agreed and noted. Thank you. And agenda item five is work program. We have brought this uh, agenda item earlier at the normal meeting because Amelia has to leave early. So to accommodate her, we have brought this uh, program earlier in the agenda. And uh, Amelia, if you want to brief on the work program. Yes, so um, members, you will have seen this is item five. Um, so there's two things to pick up that are a little bit different to normal. Um, first of all, you will see attached at the end um, a appendix two, which is a terms of reference for the piece of work around uh, voids that was discussed at the previous meeting and outlined initially um, in our meeting, I think back in June, July. Um, so that would be, uh, so there is a uh, recommendation to uh, approve that or to request amendments uh, before approval. This would then outline work both for the March meeting uh, with housing colleagues and then in April, which would be for um, other housing providers, um, which we've been in contact with you separately to discuss. So that would be the first ask. The um, second ask is in relation to the work programme. We have um, found out today there needs to be an amendment to the uh, March and the April meeting. The item relating to the localisation agenda to be deferred to April. Um, this therefore makes that April meeting quite a packed agenda. So um, there is a um, discussion to be had with you as a committee in terms of moving forward or moving items. We have discussed uh, with, we have sort of clarified options, looked at some options for you in terms of what is possible. Um, and given that there are some restrictions, none of those items could be brought forward to March. Um, and some of those items, because of availability of officers or time to prepare reports, the, um, the suggestion, the proposal on the table is to um, move the tenant engagement item into the next municipal year um, and also to extend, that still makes it quite a packed agenda, and to extend the time slot for that meeting till 5pm um, to be able to accommodate all the discussions. So just a few things there to pick up, Chair. Is that agreed? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thanks very much. And then... Agenda item six is cleaner streets, and we've got cabinet member, councillor Majid Mahmood, and uh, Darren Shea, the street scene assistant director. Over to you both, cabinet member. Sorry, councillor Bryder, he, he wants. Are we, we're on to the street cleaner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Well, hopefully all this is going to happen. I think that's the first thing we wanted to say. <laughs> um, we're very keen to work with you uh, to, um, to make it happen. Um, 
I mean, is it, it presumably it's appropriate to say this yeah. now, but we, we, would, we would really like you to consider not just the recommendations, which is the normal way forward, but, you know, the what is what does success look like as well, because um, that obviously fleshes out what we meant by the recommendations. So we're hoping that, you know, we, we, that we'll be able to work with you to make all of this happen as much as we can. Um, and I just wanted to say um, that, just to kind of be very clear, that by a locality approach and um, a local operating model, we know that we're going to, as councillors, visit the depots, which I'm sure everybody's looking forward to. Um, but what is really needed is not just a visit to the depot and then we kind of never see them again. We need to build up a relationship with the ward crews, the ward street cleaning crews, and with whoever is the manager of that crew. We need to, as local councillors in our areas, get to know these people, not so that we can with them, but so that we can build a relationship, a good working relationship where these people aren't anonymous, um, but they work with us and residents, you know, to kind of get it better. Um, so that was one of the things that we really wanted to stress. And also, um, so it's, it's about that relationship, so an ongoing relationship. The other thing that's really important is the prevention work. We're spending loads of money as a council on picking up um, awful people's litter, but um, we just need to stop it happening in the first place. So we felt, and this is what our recommendations are about, that we would like the City Council, through Councillor Mahmood and yourself, Diane, um, to really work on preventing this through a kind of through campaign campaigning, not political campaigning, but you know, a really kind of proactive um, way of encouraging people not to do it in the first place. So by the kind of uh, stuff that we've written down in here about messages under recommendation four, we were really keen that um, if we tried it on stage in Birmingham, for example having a stencil on the pavement that tells people, you know, that this white bin has been removed, it's cost X, and you couldn't have so-and-so in your area instead. So, and, and also the stuff with schools, we're not sure how much work is happening in schools, but they're absolutely crucial, not just primary schools, but secondary schools as well, um, to get the message across, because they are the key. Children are the key to getting to the parents, and um, we feel if we could be more proactive on that, that that would help. Um, so the prevention stuff and the messaging is to do with that kind of campaigning style. And I think one of the councils that spoke to us have got this, you know, when we, we started here looking at uh, litter bin um, policy, which obviously was pretty meaningless, really, without having a litter prevention strategy. That's what we really need as a city. <coughs> And other councils seem to be you know, trying to make um, to produce litter prevention strategies and make it happen through those. Um, <coughs> I think it was was it Rochdale that had the, the seven different aspects to their litter prevention strategy. One of which included trying to change people's behaviour. So we're really keen that we try and do that in the city. And the last thing I was going to say was about the local money bit. <laughs> I hope this is clear, but on recommendation eight, we put down about established, devolved, small grant budgets. <laughs> I mean, I think by that it's a, com it's a combination of things, actually. Uh, it may be that we might get some local board money. You never know. Um, so <laughs> we wait with bated breath. Um, I mean, you may want to you know, get your crews to work with us a bit more flexibly, not to give us money, but to give us some flexibility to do things slightly differently by working out that good relationship with the crews. Uh, but from my own experience in my ward, um, we've got a lot of active residents. I mean, people want to be active if you give them a chance. Uh, they get together and they raise money. 
And when they raise money, um, they obviously have to put in applications and they have to say, right, this thing is going to cost X. What one of the councils was doing which was providing, and I don't know if this is possible, some prices for, you know, a little bit or whatever. I mean, obviously then you've got to consider emptying the blessed thing. So that's why stopping it all in the first place is the answer, really. But uh, if groups do raise money, then it would be good to have some idea of costs. Um, and it is quite difficult looking through the tree for a councillor to get something simple like that. If you're a humble resident or even a humble councillor on the back bench, you know, getting through the tree to find out how much things cost is not very easy. Right, that's what I wanted to say, Chair. I hope that's uh, all right. Very easy. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Councillor Bryder. Before I open it to other members, I think it will be appropriate if a cabinet member and the Darren Chair can respond to. I'm happy to go through all the recommendations like the work we're already doing. I mean, I'm grateful for the piece of work that the committee has done. But I think it would be better if all the members made the representation okay. and I reply to all of you. Yeah, that's fine. Effectively, as opposed yeah. to coming back. Yeah. So yeah. Right. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Governor Members. Any other members want to add anything? Councillor Harmer? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'll just make a few points. Basically, in complete agreement with what Marge has said, and I think it's telling that, you know, it's the same message cross party um, because, you know, it's actually as our experience as councillors in terms of what works rather than, you know, anything that's party political in any way. Um, I think, to me, the aspect of what um, Marge said that's really important is about the local engagement. I mean, you know, one of the ways that would work in my patch, for example, would be um, giving some responsibility, for example, to the Neighbourhood Forum, which is a properly constituted Neighbourhood Forum. It gets, you know, it gets his grant from the council and so on. And you know, if, if, for example, they could you, they could say, well, we can decide where a anti-fly tipping camera goes for a period of time. Um, and then, you know, we I think one of the things that's been said is, oh, well, you know, that has to be monitored. This, that. You would find the community would monitor whether it had worked or not, because you'd get people would be keen to see whether the decision they'd taken about focusing on this area, trying to sort it out, had actually worked or not. So you wouldn't need officers to go around and check. The community would do it for you. So giving it, and, and the other then spin-off benefit from that is you get more people keen to come along to neighbourhood forum meetings to participate because they could actually feel they could actually change what the council did. So there's a sort of win-win with that. Um, and I mean, in the example that Darren will know, because we did a walkabout, we went walk past it, of, of the sort of wrong thinking, that we need to get away from is the bit where you you know you get fly tipping by a bin so the council's policy is just to remove the bin and in that particular case that i showed you what had happened was a new resident had moved in they they hadn't been told by their land into a block of flats nearby they hadn't been told by their landlord where um or hadn't been given a bin store key by their landlord so they thought well, what do we do with this well there's a bin there let's put it by the bin so taking the bin away doesn't solve that problem but with a bit of detective work, we managed to find out what was going on and got the landlord to give them a key and, and it stopped. Um, so that, but that was done not by enforcement officers, or whatever, that was just done by the community that was fed up of seeing a bag of rubbish by the bin every, every, every other day. So it, you know, the, the engagement with the community, the empowering of the community, um, and it will, you know, and the things that people want done will vary area by area. So we need something that can vary. I mean, you're talking, for example, about um, the multi, uh, the 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 HM, the mobile household re recycling centres. Um, the visits are hugely variable in, in my ward in terms of the amount of the stuff they pick up. I'd quite like to get to a position where we can keep the ones that really work and are really busy, but we use the resource if that is being currently provided for the less busy ones in other ways, whether that's picking up bulky items from people with disabilities who can't carry their furniture to the nearest MHRC visit or whatever it is. And if you have a you could have a budget that, you know, meant that the same amount of resource was spent 
you know, and done in a fair way, but that you allowed locally, well, we can have a bit of this, a bit of that, adds up to the same thing, and we get a more effective delivery of services. So I think, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm saying the same thing, but it's basically just, just, just putting a slightly, um, putting it in a, in, a, in a slightly different way. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, Councillor Farmer. Councillor Renwell. Uh, yeah. I agree as well with everything that's been said so far. I think the important thing that you mentioned about like the neighbourhood forum and sort of bringing that into use, I think it really ties up with, I think it'd be really good to have education programmes with primary and secondary schools because that is how you change minds. But it's also what happens after secondary school. You need to keep pushing those messaging. So if you don't hear anything for a period of five years, you're going to forget all the positive things that you've learned. And how do you keep um, showing that community can actually change things for the better? So I think that's just also something to, to bear in mind. As councillor Randwell. Anybody else? Oh, thank you. If should the cabinet member and uh, Darren can respond. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, as I said earlier, um, piece of work, really grateful for the work that the committee has carried out. I know you put in a lot of hours speaking to officers from different councils up and down the country to, to come to the recommendations that you have come. Um, the good news is a lot of this work is already happening. It's just that it needs to be more visible. And part of that is to invite all members to the depots in the next two months. Um, the plan is to have all members uh, have an invitation by the end of March to your depots. And at that point, you'll be able to, because currently the, the street cleaning teams, they do work on a board by board basis, but they come board the comments of Council Bridal. We do need that interaction. The way we've got members interacting with the mobile house or recycling centre crews, we need the same uh, interaction that you have with like for your beat sweeper, your mechanical sweeper. So we do have a beat sweeper going around most of the roads. And the, recently the piece of work that we did with Keeper and Tidy, they graded every single road across the city in order to give us some data as to um, what what level of cleanliness is required. The elected member survey, which um, nearly 70% of the elected members completed, that also gave us a lot of data in terms of local issues that, you, that are specific to your wards. And we tied that in with the historical data we have as a council in order to put the services there. So, so your ward crew, for example, so your ward crew in ACOX Green, they're aware of your grot spots that you've had, the historical grot spots, they're aware of the issues that Council Harm has flagged up. So they target those areas as well. So we're, we're basically picking up. But this is the first, you know, I've been, I've been in the post since end of May, May 21st, I think it was. Um, and that was the first sort of like phase one for me in terms of, picking everything up, getting to where the root cause is, then dealing with the education, because what we don't want to do is spend resources going forward, just picking stuff up from people. That's not the culture that we want to develop in the city. That's why the education is key as well in the city. And we've already started some work with, um, once we start to love your environment and going to some of the schools. So we've been to Kings Norton Nursery, the start of the very, very young age. You'd be surprised how much even the nursery children know about bins and stuff. There's one little child that still remember so excited because I wake up early morning Tuesdays because the bin lorries come and I tell my mum and dad that they come in. So it just shows that they've also got the interaction. Another child said to me about recycling. I'm in charge of the recycling in the kitchen. I have to put the paper, the cardboard to one side. So that is really necessary. So that recommendation, all I'm going to suggest is obviously it's the committee's decision that we expand that not just to schools, for colleges and universities as well, because we're already doing some work with Birmingham University, because obviously with Celia, we've got a large residential area there with the student guilds. And yesterday, in fact, I, I was out on the, on a dinner invitation and I met one of the community liaison officers at South Birmingham College. And he also wants to do some work. It's a lot be really good if you came down as a cabinet member of mine, just to like uptake on the recycling. I mentioned to him that um, part of the inner city, we do need to do a lot more work in terms of recycling, because recycling rates a really, really low. So he was very enthusiastic about that. And I've already spoken to Council McCoy. So from April, we are going to uh, sort of green that we've already been to. That was a trial. So we're going to uh, roll that out. And, and the way I'm looking at it is when we have the Love Your Environment Day, that will also be a day where we'll speak to local elected members. This is part of the conversation that you're going to have at the depot visit is to speak to your schools, because all of you change with the governors of schools and you know your schools better than we do. It would be best place to start having some educational programs with the children at the schools as well. So that would be rolled down. Councillor McCarthy is very keen to have as a joint approach with myself and with the cabinet member responsible for, for the schools 
So that's already that's already happening around the local approach and and getting to know your your staff as well, so that you also have a better understanding. Because I've always found once you once you know the people you're working with, you tend to develop a much better relationship with them. And in terms of the neighbour forums, I know they used to do a lot of work, and there's still some neighbour forums across the city. I was approached by a good example here actually in Sparkbrook Islamic Centre. They've just had one of the vans that was part of the Sparkbrook Neighbourhood Forum, which they purchased, and they want to take on that van. They want to help with like picking up the flight, similar to in Kansas Lakewood when you've got Pioneer Group there, uh, where they help in picking up some of the flight it been across, not just on their land, but also that you know, overlaps on to city council land. And we are working to try to increase the number of tip, tip notices that we can give them because overall, and collectively, to make the city cleaner, we need to be working with all partners. It's not just a city council approach, it's not just an elected member's approach, it's an approach from, from everyone. So I'm really excited about that work. Around the bins policy, that's work that we've already started. In fact, when I was in this post in 2018-19, I did actually recommend to Scoot then that a piece of work is carried out by Scoot, but it didn't materialise. Um, but that's something that we'll be working on anyway in terms of the bins policy, because obviously when we first introduced the bins in the city, just even household bins, uh, we've got a policy, you have the, two, the 180 litre if you've got uh, six, uh, five or less people in the property, then you've got between six and eight you can have the 240 litre and then above that you can have the 360 litre. Uh, that also needs to be renewed. But that will be done in combination with the work on the litter bins policy as well. Because um, as Councillor Armour said, we have we do actually, if, if a bin, if a street bin is vandalised on two occasions, we do actually take away the bin. But we are supposed to communicate that to the elected members. And I think what would be good, especially around a lot of the high streets across the city, um, is to speak to the trade association and the bins for them to also work out where the bins need to be placed. And uh, in terms of getting the cost, is we've already started some work with, uh, it'll be rolled out to members soon once we've got all the figures in situ, just around the parks, just kind of overlaps with, with what we're doing here, is uh, we're going to have costings for the friends groups in terms of the cost of bins, benches, uh, outdoor gym equipments, you know, moogers in parks. And that same approach is going to be adopted now for streets as well, so that the litter picking groups themselves, there's a lot of external funding that's available to them. Obviously, we need to look at the revenue because we still have to empty them. But the capital costs, I think if they can come from the friends groups with external funding, that would be really, really good. Um, there's a lot of also, there's, in terms of the local engagement, we set up Love Your Streets and part of their remit is to have that local engagement with litter picking groups, community groups, the police, the fire service, elected members. So I would encourage all of you to speak to Celine Ellis, the uh, the manager who is managing that particular project. And that would, you know, that's the laser focus approach to issues in your walls, like the alleyways, where we also in, in, engage with community groups is, like if you've got a private alleyway, uh, our policy is you know, we serve notice for it to be cleared, but we don't really want to go down that approach. I'd rather have a character approach where the community themselves take up ownership because based on the feedback I've had with other ca the cabinet members across the country and officers, it's it's a better approach to get the community involved, so community take ownership. And we did this in, in Quinton, and I'm sure uh, Councillor Raymond would tell me that alleyway is still really, really clean and the, 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 the uh, householders have taken ownership of that. And that's where we want to get to. So that's why we, we brought about the alleyway strategy. So people are aware of, of what where the council will, will support them and where we won't support them. Um, also, in terms of the educational programmes, because I've got um, parks and allotments, city of nature within my portfolio, I want to, when, when we do have a um, approach in schools, I'm, getting, I'm trying to work with city of nature as well. Some, some of the offices, there's a waste prevention, the marble house recycling, to have a joint approach. So it's not just going to be about you know, recycling and refuse collections in schools. It's going to be about parks and allotments and you know, nature, everything about you know, tree planting. So we have so many school children now involved. So I want to have a, like, a joint approach with everyone, not just focus on, on, on street cleansing. But although the agreement of this committee is street cleansing, but this specific, you've also got neighbourhoods as well. So I think it would, I would like to extend that. So in your recommendation, if you extend that, so it's not just about waste and recycling, also expands to you know city of nature stuff that we're doing because we've got the environment to justice map as well that's something that i really want to push around the schools because i do think that if you start them early then you know at the end of the day you know the, why, why are we here we're here for the future of the city as well in the sense that we want to make sure this city is in a much better place going forward 
and, and I think that's why it's really, really important. We are fully staffed. I think recommendation six, uh, you've got about the culture and workforce being permanent. They are highly trained. We are fully staffed recruits collection in street cleansing. I think there's about 68 vacancies, but we are recruiting going forward. Darren is nodding, so I think I'm moving on the same wavelength there. And we did learn a lot through this Commonwealth Games as well in terms of the street cleansing across the city. A lot of the uh, ideas and suggestions that we've had, and to be fair, the agency staff there, a lot of them are still em employed with us. And the other, and, and on Love Your Environment, just to mention about the joint up approach, that's that's not just your street cleansing teams, that's your parks teams, your grand maintenance teams, your graffiti teams, they're all out there on, on the same day. The only... Uh, Part of the council that we do want to do more work with is housing, but there is a discussion taking place around uh, in terms of the flight tipping, who's responsible with housing, and the, hopefully there'll be something coming forward. But again, engagement enforcement officers, um, you talked about prevention, that's really key. And by the end of this month, I think is we'll have the four six in deployment across the city. I think there's two vacancies still outstanding, but there's interviews taking place. They will have the remit to issue FBNs, and I totally agree with the recommendation around how we can uh, you know, it'd be up to human resource to deal with this, is how we can have more officers who are able to issue the FBNs, because the more you have on the ground, the much better it's for all of us. So you can have an army of people giving out the uh, FBNs to people. And I think that would work really well. In terms of money, the grant funding, I, I would love it if the leader or someone else came to me and said, look, we've got all this extra piece of money for you to divvy out to community grant groups. We've got a good example with the, um, under my parks remit, with the Burnham Space Forum. We grant them £30,000 a year for a specialist bid uh, writer. And that bid writer has bought in, I think it's half a million now, we've got to potentially half a million. So the same can happen with community groups around litter pick, and that's something that I will take forward, Berkeley budget sits with, with my colleague, Councillor Mosquito. So we do want to look into that. Love your environment, you have, you have asked for that to be expanded. You know, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, it's already at its maximum level in the sense that they're going out to the top 15 wards across the city on a monthly basis now. So wards like Mywood, Bromford, Hodgill, Yorwood, Glebe, Farm and Town Cross and Alan Rock as well. They're in the top 15. So we have the crews going out. So 15 days, 15 working days are already taken. The other wards, are, are, we're targeting once every three months. But what we are doing is we're going to review the the uh, the data we've got around flight and also the land asset management data in July, so it may shift some of the wards. So some of the wards that have been cleaned. A good example is I was at audit yesterday uh, on Tuesday. I think it was Bosley Green Ward. The first Love Your Environment day we had there, the officers, because they also need to pick as well. It's not just picking up all the fly tipping, is that they picked up 672 bags. I remember it's a single member ward, Bosley Green. And the second time they went in, I think it was in December, it came down to 313. And they've just gone recently. It came down to 67, which shows that the level of cleanliness is actually improving ac across that board and it's working. Where we would have a difficulty if we expanded that program is that it would have an effect on the business of, as usual across the rest of the city and even in those wards where you've got, we've got, you know, since we've had the three initiatives, we've got two rapid response crews, we've got six additional dumping crews. <clears throat> so that I would that would be difficult, but again, we can, we can look at resources uh, going forward around that. On your graffiti policy, I think there's a suggestion there about one of the councils with Rochdale Wigan with on private land, they would just basically remove the graffiti and deal with the consequences after. Well, we've had this discussion in this committee before about legal services being quite uh, risk averse in this council. Uh, so I do think there's a piece of work that does need to be done there currently. But what we have changed, uh, we bought this in, I think it was September when I spoke to officers. If we've had a disclaimer from a, uh, a householder or business that you can remove the graffiti, I've got them to change the wording so that you only need to take that disclaimer the once and that it's for that property and for success is entitled. So I think that's an improvement to where we were before. We do have a specialty graffiti company that does work with us, it's the Nordic, and they take on 50% of the work. And the reason they do that is because they've got some of the products that we haven't got. They can also base, I think it's gold on a higher heights than our staff have claimed to do. So our staff do the, 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 the boarding mundane stuff and know they come in with the more bigger projects like we did the underpass in Yardley. Um, that's where, where they fall in. Again, come up games, we learned a lot because they was just removing everything. But I, I am working with Councillor Phil Davis, the Chair of Life and Public Protection and Councillor John Cotton. I do think we need to set up a working group again to tackle graffiti. Same with CCTV. We've got CCTV, community safety have CCTV. 
why are we not using the same CCTV to tackle fly tipping? There is a conversation already taking place with Councillor John Cotton and and Raka Ahmed is, is nodding, so I'm, I'm on the right track there. Just a recommendation, Levin, this, this one is something that I tried, actually, when I first got back into post, and, and, and the reason I tried it, Councillor Goodwin will be aware of this, because we've got this, uh, we've got a competition, Councillor Goodwin and myself, around the uh, reporting of trolleys in our wards, and he's actually beating me by four. <laughs> he's on a 53, but well, he's beating by seven then, not six. In reporting trolley, so you put them to this app trolley wise, just take a photo, it takes your location, they come and collect the trolley for you. And what we've had a conversation trolley wise, I want to get to again, I think we're working great on legal again, is that we're able to use their link on our Birmingham City Council website. So if anyone wants to report a trolley, they can just click on the link and it goes direct trolley wise. But I've been told because there's other companies who carry out similar type work, we can't be seen to be favouring one company over the other. So we're waiting on legal to come back to us. And again, you know, we've got a waste disposal partner, Violis. So if we were to say that people need to dis you know, call in British Art Foundation or someone else, then you know, they may have an issue in terms of the contract as a legal needs to look into this. And I do think this committee is you know, does have a role in, in trying to deal with the legal issues around what we can and can't do. Yes, they, you know, we had, I don't know if you saw the press about, there was an unregistered skip in ward then just near to your ward chair on safer road, so like half of it falls into your ward, half falls into ward end. And uh, we should show you the emails that have gone round through highways, through through ourselves, through waste enforcement, just trying to get an unregistered skip removed. It was attracting rodents, it was, you know, it was difficult for any wheelchair user to use the pavement because it was half on the pavement, half on, on the highway. The highway was had two yellow lines as well. So we just removed it yesterday. And, you know, we, we, we've taken the approach to Council Martin Bright have said, you know, deal with it and deal with the consequences later. So we've just take, take, picked it up because of the issues that were surrounding. Business owners were calling, residents were calling. It was just horrific. And we've done that. Um, move that forward. The business about in, in your recommendation 12, we'll get on to the last one now. Um, just mindful that we've got an army of officers here for the next item agenda, so you probably want to speak to them as well. Uh, there does need to be a bins rationalisation programme. I think those that were here before May of last year, since 2019, we did carry out a review on the bins rationalisation where we, where we took input from all elected members. All elected members were invited to have input in terms of where the bin should be located. And again, this is something that when you're at the depot, it's something that we can have a conversation with. But we'll also draft a new uh, uh, schedule of street bins, because I think you all need to know where your street bins are located as well. What we want, what we don't want to do is the approach that counts the harbour um, flagged up is just remove the bins because they've been vandalised or there's been flight been up those bins. We need to get to the root cause. That's where waste prevention needs to come in. And also, our refuse collections and other workers are doing a fantastic job in reporting contaminated bins, broken bins. And we also want to expand that where we get to a situation where they also speak more with households as well to get to the root cause. A lot, a lot of the issues happen when you've got some new households moved in and they're not really aware. And I think another uh, idea I am looking at is around notifying people again when they're collection days as well, especially those in flats above shops, because that's where we are, we are facing a challenge in dealing with them. And with where you've got lots of HMOs and exempt property, exempt housing properties in the city. But we are, this deal of, has given us a task to some, some of our staff to reassess the the uh, the, uh, the bins at HMOs so and ensure that they've got the, rel the relevant size bins as well. So I think that would help us going forward. So, so overall, yeah, really, really pleased with the recommendations. If you could just expand one or two of them so you give us more work to do, we're more than happy to do that. Uh, more than happy to come back next month or, or the month after. Thank, Thank you very much, Cabinet Member, for a very comprehensive response. In terms of legal services, we got them in the March meeting coming. So that should resolve some of the issues with them. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank for all the recommendations that you agreed and following the response, any other member here? Just, just to say, it's been really helpful. I mean, it sounds like there's a willingness, which is good. Um, but I think, you know, it would be really helpful if you, when you come back in um, April, I think it is, isn't it, that you could come back with a sort of step-by-step -step implementation plan against each of these recommendations and what does success look like. 
if you come back and set that out for us simply and clearly so we can see exactly what's going to happen when, um, I think we will be really pleased uh, and perhaps, you know, we'll want to continue working together. Um, on the lovely environment, I was just going to say that I think a key thing with a lot of this is it's about talking with us, talking with the wards. So with lovelier environment, we could really perhaps make use of it even more. Um, not not so much about expanding it, but just if you could just plan it with us, then we could make maximum use of it. Um, I mean, I only have when I ask for the information. I just have a map sent to me in my ward with some colours on it that showed me that Love Your Street was going to be here, um, the bin crew were going to be there, the flight bin crew were going to be here, but there was no discussion with me or with the local residents in my group. So. <laughs> and we could make much more use of that, you know, if that kind of approach was taken. So anyway, we look forward to the future. Coming back with that implementation plan in April, um, and we have high hopes that we're going to move forward. Um, the state of the area, I've been out this morning in my room. I, I, I can't even remember who takes the litter off the grass now. The grass verges and grass areas, like central reservations in, you know, where you've got streets on either side, just full of litter. Who clears the grass? <laughs> who does it? Is it, is it? is it you or is it? Yeah, through, through your chest. So the, so the central reservations, because of health and safety, they they the litter picked on the Sunday on the Sunday. I've so always said this. Now? When I was growing up in Alum Rock, every Sunday, my father, bless him, he they all used to clean the frontages of their properties, including the highway. We really need to get back to where develop a culture where people take responsibility as well. Because unless unless we have the resources, uh, to sweep the streets, pick up litter on a daily basis, we're not going to get to that position. But I'm more than happy to take back what, what you've said around the step-by-step -step implementation at the end of the timeline, yeah. let you know what we do. Around the lovely environment, we have to have a balance because initially when I set it up with, with the street managers, we did give notice to elected members, and I'll, I'll, and I'll be frank with you, um, in two wards, uh, notification was given to residents and they made it into a free bulky collection. So we, ha we had crews going down the road to pick up the fly tipping that was there. But then householders were coming out with items and giving them to the to the crews. We don't want to get to that situation again. So what we what we are doing, we've got one of the officers, when you're going to get notification of your mobile house and recycling centres, you'll also get notification if there's a love your environment in your ward on that day, because a love your environment only takes place when you have a mobile house or recycling centre, and but we don't advertise the um, love your environment, but I take on board, there's key community groups in your areas that do need to know because they can participate in joint working with us and, and that we're going to allow members to do that. But what we don't want is members to advertise a free bulky collection like the olden days when we used to have a special street collection where we used to deliver letters for every house and, and everything used to be school to fully bring out the dead. Everything used to come out. We just don't have the resources to pick that up. But we are taking those comments on board. So you will be notified of the dates and we're leaving it. You know, we're, we're trusted members here. So that you only notify, for example, there's been a request come through from Erdington for a lovely environment, they want to know when it was, and they've, they've, they've said to me that they just want to know for their little litter, uh, litter busters, and they're a really, really good team that face litter pick up across 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 Erdington and across the city, because I've done some work with them as well. And I think it would be key to have that joint work, but you've still got Love Your Streets, which is your sort of laser-like focus approach with key community groups to be able to deliver that service jointly working with community groups. But, you know, we, I think... Based on the data, and I can only go on the evidence, and as a lawyer, I go on the evidence, the fly tipping has significantly reduced, the land asset management data over the last few months has significantly improved, and I want to get to a position in July where some of the wards which were really bad in terms of fly tipping and land data have now come out of the top 50, and we've swapped them around, so we can allocate resources elsewhere to 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 to, to the to, to the wards across the city. But I think all of us have the same interests at heart, we want to see a cleaner, greener city. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Kevin. Remember, Councillor Goodwin? Yeah, just a, I think a couple of points to pick up on this. I completely must agree with absolutely everything that's just been said. Fixed penalty notices, 
can't come quick enough for me. I really, really, as Councilman Mood would, would attest to, I'm forever standing in front of somebody who's dumped rubbish somewhere. And um, I have to say thank you to the guys in enforcement because I do believe that we are in the place where we should be released. Uh, the evidence I've passed to them and um, a, a prosec- perhaps a prosecution will be in offing. So I'm really, really pleased about that. And that will send a clear message out to that person who, who decided fly tipping and doing what they did was um, acceptable when it's not. And the community in Castle Vale are completely and utterly behind that. And they, they are kind. If you see my Facebook page, I don't see anybody saying, but they're saying, can you name and shame? And I'm saying, no, for legal issues, you can't. Education, I think, is hugely important, but I do think there's an issue uh, with this that we might want to think about. So I've been invited by all the primary schools to go and out with litter picking and talk to them about litter picking and clean streets. And that's really, really positive. Uh, St Gerard's uh, invites me to be one of their mini vinnies who, who are their kind of litter picking group. That's brilliant. I think there's a bit here about secondary schools. Because I can see all this hard work going on with, with, with younger children, where it's brilliant. And then I won't name and shame any particular secondary school, but it gets to a secondary school stage and all of a sudden it gets lost somewhere. Now, in fact, you know, surely as part of that curriculum, we've got to kind of encourage the secondary schools to continue that hard work. It becomes all that hard work that's gone on in junior infant school with, with, with our teachers and the amazing work that's gone on there clearly is amazing work. It will get lost. And five years down the road, which is a short space of time, other, other practices will have come into place and we'll have lost all that hard work. So my, 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 my words would be, I think, yes, absolutely. Education is hugely important. And there's a lot of good work going on in, in, in junior infant primary. It, but I think the secondary school has been much, much time in all of this. So, but yeah, and I think the street cleaning stuff's great. I mean, I see the the guys regularly on Castle Vale, and they're always happy to have their photo taken so I can promote what they're doing, which is important. I think that we, we celebrate that stuff. Thanks, Councillor Goodwin. If there's nobody else to ask anything, then can we formally, as a committee, agree Cheers. those recommendations? Yeah, okay. Oh. I agree with you. I think. The people out in the city now want a zero zero tolerance approach to 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 fly tipping and people throwing litter on the streets. So so fully on board board with that, and we're going to keep pushing that, naming and shaming, and we're going to look at some more approaches around that because Grime Watch has been it's been good, but I don't I think there's room for improvement. So we need to like find new ways of naming and shaming. I've done it myself, and I've just managed to get some CCTV footage and. You know, shame someone who's not on people's doors. Yeah, the of that that's part of the work that's going to be carried out by the waste prevention team. Uh, community grants, um, we, we do actually invest £100,000 for list picking equipment, which we can give to groups. I think you've been a beneficiary yourself because you set up a group. For, and that can also be extended to schools, and co- uh, schools uh, both primary and secondary, if they want to have some input. But totally agree with you. That's why I want the recommendation expanded. Uh, to not include just schools, but also colleges and universities, because it's it's approach from 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 cradle to grave. Everybody needs to know about uh, uh, you know recycling and and a little bit and everything else. And the issue around secondary schools, I've got a particular issue in my ward. I just, with your permission, chair, share is around graffiti, um, where we've got public right away between Bromford Road and Twycross Grove. Um, it's you've got four schools on the campus. You've got Hodge Hill Primary. Hodge Girls, Hodge College and Braden Special School. And we get that graffiti removed. If, you know, some of it's very, very in- offensive. Love your environments come, love your streets have come. But we don't get to the root cause. The root cause, we, we, we believe it's from the schools that it's probably some of these children based on the information that we've had from residents. But we need to get into the schools to ask them, look, can you support us? And trying to find the culprits here because we can't continue. If I was, to, if I, I'll be honest, if I sent someone every day to clear that graffiti, it probably still wouldn't be enough because as soon as it's, it's cleared, someone else will come and do it again. That's why I really want to set up this working group with colleagues as well to get to the root cause where we can do it. And the police, I'll be honest, Chair, they really need to do more. They seem to like leave these things to the city council, keep pushing the boat towards, but they also need to behave well. They also need to take a zero tolerance approach to, you know, it's, it's criminal flight tipping, it's criminal. They also need to be on board with ourselves and want to get to the root cause. 
yeah, ha- happy with, with all the comments of Councillor Goodwin. Hopefully, when I'm back next month, I would have reported more trolleys than Councillor Goodwin has. I've never really lost them. don't want to lose. Thank, Thank you, you Cabinet Member. Uh, can we formally agree the recommendations? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have to move on to the agenda item seven, which is performance monitoring. And from city operations, we've got Jonathan Antel, head of business improvement and support, he's online. And we got Waka Raman, assistant director, community director, community safety and resilience, Sajila Nasir, director of regulations and enforcement, and Darren Fay from Street C. Can we start with Jonathan yourself? Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the month nine report for city operations, which starts on page 55. On this occasion, we are introducing the community safety KPIs from WACAR's division. That brings the total indicators to 15, and that consists of five vital signs and 10 corporate plan measures. As the committee members will have already read the document, I will now invite any questions to my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Any questions to Jonathan? Yes, Councillor Harmer. Uh, <coughs> so I note that we are still 86% above the target in terms of reported miscollections, which obviously we've been through many times the issue that the number of reported miscollections is only a tiny minority. Of the actual um, it is interesting that there isn't a particularly close correlation between the number of miscollections reported by individual residents and the number of drop roads. And I would be interested to see if there's an explanation for that, because um, it does seem odd how the number of um, dropped roads reported by the department has gone down much faster than the um, number of reported miscollections. Um, on the um, antisocial behaviour um, reports, um, I think we do need to do something um, in terms of um, getting a better, getting some better. Um, uh, performance indicators um, because um, we've got, for example, the one that says the percentage of inquiries responded to within 48 hours from the community safety team front door. Well, I'm always very suspicious of indi indicators like this that just tell you it's 100%, 100%, 100%. If that is sending out, an, you know, like an out of office style email acknowledgement, so what? I mean, responded to. I don't count an email acknowledgement as a response. It's it's welcome. You know that your complaint has reached where it needs to reach. It's not actually a response to the complaint. Um, so could could we um, actually just you know could could someone actually say is it more than that? Um, but if it isn't, you know, I don't quite see the value in in having a performance indicator which just says you've acknowledged something. Um, and am I moving on to housing here after that? I think yeah. it's switch over to housing halfway through the report. Because we're are we going to stop? Wait for the next. Wait for the next. Do that, do that afterwards. Yeah. Anything? No, no. I think most of them I can cover the ASB. Okay. Whoever is it, Darren? Yeah, it's it's me on the uh, mis mis collection. So mis collection is a classic uh, issue that we've, had. we've been wrestling for a number of years, and how we report. And the aim is to try and provide as much information. So the, the mis bin collection for 100,000 is probably the single inquiry, even if we. Uh, even if we haven't been out there because it's been tagged or everything, all of those are recorded in that so yeah, in, in that uh, the first table, and that table relates to um, every single property against that hundred thousand, um, and it's generally higher. Uh, but currently, we're running at thirteen. Probably. 
So that has been the reason. Reason it's what is the this road is slight when people are looking at this coming down quicker compared to these collections. It's almost the scale of the you know, it's the scale of the benchmark target. Target is quite a bit roads in um in there but what gets the budget has property. So the it's it's the nature of it because of the road compared to the need of the book. But sorry, that doesn't answer the point about why the number of roads gone down by it looks like just you know about seeing the actual figures are factor of ten, whereas the number of reported police collections has fallen slightly. You would expect a tighter correlation between the two. You'd have to go back and have a look at the, 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 seems, the information. You, you just when you see that level of difference, one becomes suspicious that um, perhaps not all the roads are actually being reported as missed, because otherwise you'd expect to see a bigger fall in residents complaining. That's that's the concern. Uh, yes, it is the concern. <laughs> the issue that we've had is the majority of roads, we tend to end up about the size of the road and the individual roads. So we need to, I need to go back and look at the data rather than Yeah, okay. So yeah, sure. Take that back on, yeah, on. sure. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the community safety front door and then I'll um, come on to the antisocial behaviour. So, the, yeah. um, uh, as Jonathan said, these are new indicators that we're introducing and actually these will evolve and they'll get better over time. And then the key thing for us as we're introducing um, uh, the indicators is to look at our customer satisfaction journey as well. So, we'll, we'll be looking at the, the customer experience in terms of getting immediate responses, but actually, what do we then do with those responses? making sure that we've got the right categories as what are service requests, what are um, uh, requests for support, and what are just simple inquiries. So what, what you'll get moving forward, we're, we're piloting and testing that within the service at the moment, as we're more confident about the, the quality of the data and the categories that we'll have, these um, KPIs will evolve into that so that you can interrogate the data a lot more. We just wanted to make sure that the, the, the KPIs, as they're being introduced into the data we hold, are then more exposed into scrutiny conversations or that we can interrogate, uh, interrogate it as a service as well. What you will get moving forward in terms of the narratives that we'll put together for this is a better explanation and understanding as to once an inquiry is received. It's not just an automated response. It is a manager that picks that up, responds, and then is holding that inquiry. What we want to be able to track is, well, then how long is that inquiry held for, how long it remains open, um, um, so if we've got a, a inquiry that, uh, or, or a service um, a support request that's open for, say, 28 days, um, what parameters do we want to put in place, i.e. there needs to be a response, initial response in 14 days? What does that mean in terms of an escalation if an inquiry is not closed? Um, and then categorising that so that we can understand um, all the different inquiries that are put in place. The community safety front door was only introduced a couple of years ago, and, and it was to make sure that where we were missing community safety related inquiries that were going into the contact centre elsewhere, there was a mechanism for the community safety team to be able to pick that up. So that's open to partner agencies who may be at, um, uh, putting requests in. It also picks up member related inquiries as well. So we want to make sure that when we present the data to you, we're, we're categorising it in the right way. Um, on the antisocial behaviour uh, a bit, so that's data that we're holding with with housing colleagues. We will, over time, as we're, we're looking at the whole range of antisocial behaviour uh, issues that we get, including things that we may pick up as part of PSPOs and breach orders, we want to be able to include that data moving forward. So what you've got there at the moment is the totality of inquiries coming in to Birmingham City Council. But when we interrogate that data moving forward, we'll be able to break that up for you as well. So it, it was important that we were able to, as part of this process, introduce more community safety related indicators into the process and then be able to interrogate that data so that we're confident of the data that we're receiving. We're avoiding any duplication of data that's coming through and that will take a little bit of time before we get proper um, um, uh, full KPIs to be able to then break that further. So you'll always get a, a totality of ASB queries coming in. What you'll, follow, uh, what you'll find with follow-up suites of indicators is then the breakdown as to what that looks like overall. Thanks. Councillor Harmer. 
Yeah, I mean, just to come back on that, and I accept, obviously, you've got new KPIs, it takes a little while to head down which are the ideal ones. But um, I think we need somehow um, to get particularly into, well, one, one of the aspects of it that we need to get into is the um, housing, city council housing related responses. So this sort of straddles between the two reports, away, but there's nothing in the housing report about a, about ASB. It's all sitting in this side of it. So I'm going to talk about in context of this and whether it actually ends up in this bit or the next bit. You can, you, you can look at that. But I think we have a very serious issue in this council where, uh, well, in this city, where we have um, category one sheltered accommodation, um, which is in my ward is in separate schemes and in power blocks, where changes in the rules mean that basically anyone off the waiting list who's over 50 will, can go in. Um, we've through, I believe, entirely erroneous uh, concerns about GDPR, stripped out all the CCTV from the entrance lobbies to our tower blocks. We've got people going in because of the way, because of the, the way the country one is defined now, who have serious needs, people who have been cuckooed, people who are themselves are causing major problems. And right across, certainly, the five tower blocks in B27, three of which are in Tysey Haymills Ward, three, two of which are in my ward, really, really serious issues with ASB, which are not getting resolved and not getting dealt with um, until they get to the point where the police intervene. So, um, I, yeah, I think we need to, it's a separate issue to actually what we actually do to deal with it. But as part of that, we need some sort of measure of the volume of what's happening. I would like to see a KPI that actually looks at the number of reports of um, ASB within our sheltered housing schemes, particularly the Category 1 one, the Category one schemes that seem to have basically no protection anymore against these sorts of issues. Um, so that that would then drive, you know, an understanding of exactly how bad that is. I don't believe it's just in my ward. I believe from talking to other councillors, it's right across the city that we've got this problem and we need to be monitoring it and keeping track of it. Thank you, Councillor Rama. Welcome. Yeah, so we're currently working very, very closely with city housing colleagues. Um, we are looking at a broader approach to antisocial behaviour in the whole. We are interrogating the data closely with them. We can take that away and we can bring that back in, in terms of, again, it's very similar to the CSP inquiries. We need to understand what categories we're, we're bringing forward and what categories can give you meaningful um, interrogation to the data and, and, and what the key core priorities are. On top of the data, it's really important for us to kind of stress some of the data um, uh, here, which is solely from a council perspective and data that's coming into city housing colleagues and that we will work with city housing colleagues on. We also have data that is going out and, and, and is being captured by West Midlands Police, which includes some of the tier one type uh, inquiries that we may forward to them. What we want to do is avoid the duplication of the data being presented back in. And that's why I think the evolution of trying to get the data here to give you an overall picture of the inquiries that we respond to as a council and then the, also the inquiries where we, we, we've got as part of our request reports going into partner agencies we can follow that chain mm -hmm. uh, uh, and not duplicate sure. the, the data coming back in so that's why it's taking a little bit of time but yep. they will be sorted soon but we can certainly take that away and we'll work with city housing colleagues as to the categories that we'll use um, uh, to bring back as KPIs, how they're presented, whether they sit with city housing or whether they're sitting community safety, shouldn't be a matter as long as you're 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 content and comfortable, and as long as we as a council are able to then interrogate that data in the way that we need to. Thanks, Parker. Uh, Natalie, you want? Yeah, uh, it was previously raised before where we talked about KPIs for antisocial behaviour, and for housing we have got a. Um, and the social care dashboards that we have created. So we have got visibility of um, how often we are contacting customers in our social care because these, we've got this visibility down to officer level and we've got visibility at the world level. So people are around shouted as a one off um, and what that looks like from the board and the data perspective. We've done a lot of development within IVR reporting at the moment with these details. So, we are really on journey to improve our data and to really have a performance driven response. Um, and that is something that, that we've got and that I can share 
Councillor Harmon. I know you asked for it previously, it was on the table, but I, mean, I think you just got overlooked when you say last time. Thanks, Natalie. Can I bring uh, Sajila? You know, as you have heard earlier on, while other councils are very proactively issuing PCNs, and uh, how can your department improve on in terms of PCNs in relation to what is in chair? I'm talking about enforcement as a city operations, you know, that comes under. But if you want to add anything from your department. Use litter, littering. Oh, Fly tipping and littering. Yeah. yeah so, pardon me, so, so um, we do serve um, FPNs, uh, fixed penalty notices, in terms of littering. We do that through a contracted service um, with, um, with another third party organisation. Uh, we're very proactive in that, um, and most of our services are provided in the city centre. And the reason for that is because. Um, that is where we have the highest rate of where we will actually observe the litter being dropped. So in order to serve the fixed penalty you notice, know, you have to see the litter dropped and you have to see the person walk away from the litter. And I also, say when we talk about litter, we're talking about things that include cigarette butts and also include spitting. So I think that people will be interested to know we've served about 11 of those and recently in the last year of spitting and they have all been paid. Um, we're also doing exercises in the um, more suburban um, retail areas um, and we're uh, articulating that through our licensed and public protection committee where those exercises are being carried out and also the information that I believe the leader sent out to all the councillors recently um, about um, successful prosecutions um, that are fall within the umbrella of licensing and public protection. Within that information, in terms of whether something amounts to actually take enforcement action through the courts as a form of prosecution, would only be if the fixed penalty notice wasn't paid. So, for instance, um, there hasn't been a great overview of the, the spitting FPNs because they were all paid, so we never progressed to a proper prosecution. So, we're very, very proactive in um, furthering those fixed penalty notices, and we have whole structures around, around that service. Um, uh, and, and certainly we think it's been a success and the information we share in our PPC is both by uh, the ward where the um, offence was um, occurred and also the ward where the offender lives. Yeah, Councillor Harmer? Just to come back specifically on that because it was questions I asked about where um, the fixed ventilators were being issued but actually sort of like edge of it, some, some of this, and at that point, for example, the figure was, but it was something like 98% of the literary were being issued the day people were brought. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, I understand fully that um, if you're, if you're issuing, if you're contracting out to a third party who gets rewarded based on the number of fines they issue, they're going to want to put all their work into the city centre, but the problem is that people then get get to know that the only risk of getting done for littering or spitting or whatever is if you're in the city centre that it's a free for all out in the suburbs. Um, so I welcome the fact that there are now uh, there is work being done in the suburban shopping centres, but I am still concerned from looking at the volume data, um, particularly you know, the amount that's still going on in the city centre compared with, say, for example, that that goes on in a Green shopping centre. Acock Stream Village, um, that we're still too heavily biased towards the city centre, no doubt for commercial reasons by the by the people we contract to do this work, and that we actually need to specify a higher volume of time and FPNs needs to be um, delivered in the suburban areas so that people realise there is a realistic risk that it can be better um, in those areas. You're likely to get by just if you currently are in the city centre. Yeah. Um, there is no more for it came to the to the issue forces with the party, so our contract is established in that way. And um, where we direct them to go is where the city council um, senior officers believe that will be most productive. Um, we have previously 
um, tested being in suburban retail areas where um, obviously we've had to pay for the services of the contractor to be there where we actually ha haven't been successful in, in serving an FPM because if you can imagine the footfall that goes through the city centre is so much higher that the likelihood of, of evidencing the dropping of litter results in so many more FPMs being served we do know that ward councillors are very concerned and they do want the FPN exercises, littering exercises done in their wards, which is why we are doing this and when we carry out and um, we gather the data, we can get a, a fuller picture then of profitivity um, within those um, outlying retail areas that hopefully will be feed uh, strategy as we go forward. So I have to come back. It is. It's, this shouldn't be just about productivity because if it's about productivity, you will do it all in the city centre. You won't do it anywhere else, and that will send the message out to people that it's you're at risk of being done if you fly if you litter in the city centre, and there's no risk anywhere else. We have to accept there will be lower productivity elsewhere, so that residents, so that people who are unfortunately inclined to litter realise there's a risk. We litter pick community groups in Acox Green litter pick literally hundreds of bags of litter from the streets of Acox Green every month. So there is a huge problem with littering. It may be that you get fewer um, fixed penalty notices issues there because the, the volume of people crammed together in one place is lower, but there is a major, major problem. And it, it shouldn't just be viewed in terms of the number of tickets you issue per session. It's about making people realize that there is a potential that you'll get fined if you do it anywhere in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harmer. The comments have taken on board and I think we're, we're already reacting to, to that, uh, but um, I shall ensure that uh, those exercises are carried out. Other member to ask any question? No? Thanks, uh, Jonathan. Thanks, Sajila, and thanks, Vaka. We'll have to move to the next item, which is uh, city housing, and we've got Mira Gola, head of uh, Business, business business improvement and support, and we've got quite a few other officers, but we'll take up with the uh, Maya Mira. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, item seven of your agenda pack is the city housing performance report, <coughs> and it also includes the city housing local government ombudsman of April to December. Um, this starts on page 71 of the pack. <clears throat> um, so, with regards to the performance update, we've got seven vital signs that we're reporting from the line and the summary position of those that have bright ratings. We've got three that are green as outlined in the report, and we've got three that are red again as outlined in the report. <clears throat> the seventh vital sign is, those, uh, is the total number of households in bed and breakfast. And we've also got three quarterly corporate plan KPIs as well that are reported. So we've got uh, the summary position for those as well in the report. And those that have a brag rating, we've got one that's blue, as outlined, and one that is red. And the third corporate plan KPI is the number of households living in temporary accommodation per thousand household. Um, we've also got, as I've referenced, the um, local government ombudsman update as well. This starts on page 84 of your pack. Um, there is some overarching important context at the start of that pack. Um, so to confirm, um, the housing ombudsman did monitor closely closed housing repairs between the period March and September of 22. There were 14 cases monitored in total. Um, and the important thing to note here is that the cases and um, the timescale for those cases report to the period 2017 to 2021, which is actually prior to the new corporate complaints process being brought in, which was effective in the spring 21. <clears throat> the Housing Ombudsman Special Report was published formally on the 17th of January this year, and the recommendations from that special report fall into four key headings. <clears throat> We've got response to repairs, record keeping, complaint handling and compensation deadline and sorry, compensation and the deadline for compliance is the 17th of April this year. To confirm that there is a robust action plan that's being put in place um, and meetings, regular meetings are scheduled with the Housing Ombudsman 
<clears throat> the next meeting is scheduled for the 23rd of February. The rest of the report, as you'll see, so from page 85 onwards, it talks about the number of closed matters, the total and the percentage of upheld and the compensation paid for the period April, 1st of April to the 31st of December 22, and for the whole of the previous year. Um, early, indicator, early indications suggest that the numbers of the matters closed and upheld are consistent across the two years. Um, and you can see that in the figures that are being reported, 35% for 21, 22, and 36% for 22, 23 to date. Page 85 of the report shows where compensation has increased with three months until the year end. Um, and please note that there will be matters um, that are remaining for 22, 23, which have not yet closed. Page 86 shows a breakdown of the closed matters for the period and a pie, pie chart showing the breakdown of the compensation paid out across the different areas. There is just one very small typo in the table that's on that page, so the number not held should be recorded as 12 and not 11. Pages 87 to 89 provide a breakdown of the total compensation paid and not broken down the service area and the number of matters of power to the service area. And the final two pages of the report outline the key actions and the improvement that's being taken by the director to date. Thank you, Peter. Hello, um, Thanks for the update. I suppose my question is a bit around given the report that's come in and given the issues that we know exist with mould, with damp, with the standard and uh, quality of the housing, um, is there a, a KPI we can put in place that actually ascertains the, the quality of housing within the stock and within the portfolio right now? At the moment, obviously, we've got um, KPIs that look at sort of percentage of house, council housing uh, routine repairs resolved within 30 days, which is all green, but it doesn't reflect the actual position. Let's see, Stan. Thank you. Um, so there is a, there is a KPI, it's a decency KPI. It's, a, it's not in front of you at the mm -hmm. moment, uh, but we can we can furnish you with that information. And unfortunately, it's 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 not a good news story um, where where Birmingham is in that regard. So our our decency levels are around sixty percent. Um, the, the team have just been recently reassessing where we are. So the good the good news, and it is it is um, you know really positive to report, is that the work that team team on this the finance team is by the way that's delivered a you know a product a, a, a hra business plan they might sound like a bit techy but that is really important work that shows that we, how much we can afford to borrow and invest in the stock over the next five seven years so that 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 plan will be coming forward when it's gone through due diligence and further work will be coming forward and a later in the year um, and I mean a few months, not, not you know, the end of the year. Um, at that point, we'll be able to be clear then about what, what, the, what the path is, I guess, between where we are now and getting our, our homes back where they need to be, which is a, closer to that 100% DTC. So that, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's the, the measure that's in place. Now that's the work that's underway. You know, and, and the reason it takes a little bit of time to do this, because there's quite a lot of granular detail in this will go down to which kitchens, which bathrooms, which work that's going to contribute towards preventing, you know, damp and mould and things like that. And the, the one thing I would say on damp and mould is that, and these are not our statistics, they're the Ombudsman's own statistics. When you compare us with similar landlords, uh, you know, Leeds, Southwark, or the large RPs. There's not many that are similar to Birmingham because we're so huge. Uh, but if you if you look at us compared to others, we actually perform as well, if not better, in terms of reports of damper mould. And that's not me being complacent, saying it's great because it's not good to get reports of damper mould, and we need to respond to them quickly and and uh, and efficiently. Um, but it it does, I guess, paint a bit of a picture that's a national picture of underinvestment in social housing. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you very much. Welcome um, 
that's getting regular updates on what percentage of the stock is meets a decent extent because we're having to do um, huge, hugely more repairs per property because of that decency issue. So the fact that we're meeting the performance targets on how quickly the repairs are done, that is important, obviously, but the real goal is to drive down the number of repairs that need to be done by, by hitting the decency targets. Um, I've got a question on um, the voids. I'm sure if Councillor Wood were here, you'd be asking this question, um, which it, it, it seems to be a sort of odd thing in that we've got we've got an overall rise in the days to turn around voids, but that seems to be entirely um, a issue um, with sort of north versus south. So the um, performance data from the north is 24 and a half days um, and 64 days um, in the south. Now, the explanation under that says, well, it's because of Christmas. Well, as far as I'm aware, Christmas happened everywhere in the city. So that is not an explanation for why the performance data varies so much between contractors. And equally, the other explanation, which is you know, difficulty in the supply chain of getting materials, that's affecting everybody as well. So there actually seems to be an issue with a contractor here rather than an issue with Christmas stroke um, supply chain. So could we have a bit of commentary about that. I mean, clearly, um, we, we, these performance data shine a light on the huge issue we've got with temporary accommodation. Um, the fact that we've not been able to make any progress in terms of reduction of households in bed and breakfast against a target of reducing it to zero is perhaps predictable, but it's, it, it is extremely depressing given the amount of effort that's gone in to try and achieve that. And those those figures on bed and breakfast um, seem to indicate that that increase in capacity with Oscott Gardens has just been absorbed and has, because of the rising demand, has basically left the, you know, had no impact on the, on the overall market because it's stopped it growing, but it's it's not enabled us to, to reduce it. Um, and given the volume of residents in yeah. Oh, I think, yeah, the other thing about the volume of residents in, in TA, there is a massive difference in the commentary um, between, so it's Manchester significantly higher, but you look at Sheffield and Leeds where they're not just a bit lower, they are sort of 10% of our levels. So what is it that they are doing differently? Or, or is it just their, you know, their economy is in a different state? Or what, what is it that enables them? Because Leeds is often held up as the best comparator in terms of scale um, in terms of the core cities to Birmingham, it's the nearest to us in size. But why are they managing to get 0.28 and we're at 10.4? That's a huge difference. Um, but if we are going to be left with um, this significant volume of, of residents in TA in the long term, which looks likely, um, I think we actually need to look about um, how well we're performing in terms of where they are. Uh, because it makes a huge difference to a resident if you're if you come from ACOX Green and then you're put in one of the the, the the TA resources in ACOX Green, at least you can you keep your family support, your children are going to the same school. That makes a huge difference to you. So how well we're able to shuffle the, the cards in terms of putting people near to the communities they know is sadly, you know, we don't want to get into it. Sadly it's gonna be there. We need to work out how well we're doing in terms of um, keeping people out their, their social support that they have. Um, and finally, I just want to get a comment on the Ombudsman report. Um, clearly, the focus has been on the damp and mild issue, and that is um, quite right. And it, it ties back in with the point we we're making earlier about the decency standard. But I just wanted to pick up one thing that is it's fascinating in terms of the performance of the department, which is the compensation claims. Because my, my concern on reading the report about that aspect of it, um, tied in with um, two items, two bits of case work I've had, is just the sheer time and the number of badgering you have to do to actually get your compensation processed and paid. I had one bit of case work where it was, it was very, very clear that it was 
the council's fault and it was well understood what had gone wrong. Um, our resident put in a compensation claim in May last year. They got paid in December. Um, I've got another one where it's still outstanding. And I've chased every, you know, all all up through the chain, and I'm still not getting any. I don't, I don't, I just don't get responses to the these work chases. It's just, you know, this still hasn't been responded to. Silence back. It still hasn't been responded to. Silence back. So, what he, do we have effective management of? The compensation claim caseload. Uh, it doesn't, from my anecdotal um, evidence of casework, it doesn't seem we do. And and the ombudsman was saying much the same thing. So it's not so much about what the what the compensation was for and the amount here, but how are we actually processing it in a prompt way? Thank you, Chair. Hi, Chair. If, if, if I could start, and then I'll bring the officers in from the team to, to, add, to add a bit more detail, if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. So, so um, we started with voids. I think Councillor Armour. So, but with regard to voids, you're absolutely right. I mean, Christmas is a contributory factor. But to be honest, we had problems before Christmas. We've got problems after Christmas. It, it, the problems are, as you say, more seated with the contractor relationship and the contractor performance in that particular area of the city. Um, now, um, the other three areas, the target for turning boys around is 28 days, are all performing within target. So I think it's, you know, it's important to, hopefully the report makes that really clear to, to, to cite that. What's not good is really poor performance from, from the contractor in the south of the city. Um, I myself uh, joined um, Asha, Asha earlier, um, uh, well, last week actually, um, for a discussion with the senior the most senior officers in the Fortum um, organisation you are delivering those those services to discuss um, you know their improvement and what we can report without going into too much detail bearing in mind this is a public meeting uh, is that you know the the necessary action is being taken in terms of rectification and process within the contract to to you know to kind of really accelerate our um, our action in this regard and. Uh, it's a bit woolly that statement, but I'm not going into too much detail. You can imagine the nature of the discussions because they are dragging the whole city down. I, I will remind this committee that the financial consequences, because there's a financial consequence to not turning voids around on time, the rent loss, the council loss, all of that is being met by the contractor for that area at the moment. Um, it's some compensation for the fact that they are poorly performing. Um, it's still not getting the keys to people that badly need housing in time. So I'm still, you know, um, really concerned about this, as I know Asher is. Um, so I'll bring Asher on, in on that in a few minutes, but just briefly to respond to your other points, Councillor Hartman. So on on b, &B um, again, absolutely spot on. You know, the overall numbers slightly up. Um, you know, our, our families' figures slightly up. Um, we're now, um, and you know, Stephen will update in a, in, in a few minutes. But we are now seeing 600 plus people presenting each week. Um, you know, their actual numbers <laughs> of people walking through the door. We're seeing lots of families and individuals we've not seen before. It's not the classic, you know, repeat homelessness that we've seen over the years. Uh, these are people who are completely new to us. Um, the the knock-on effect of, unfortunately, cost of living crisis and, and other factors uh, are no doubt contributing. Uh, we've seen uh, private rented sector evictions uh, reach twice what they were about a year ago. That's a huge contributory factor, obviously, to where we're at. So it kind of, it, it's obvious really, but ju just to make it really clear, you know, we don't enter into the winter and then everything happens all at once people falling behind with their payments and falling behind with their, um, you know, their general budget management takes some months. And, you know, I feel that we've not seen the peak yet of that. Now, on the positive side of that, it's OK, well, what are you doing about it? On the positive side of that, um, again, Stephen will, uh, will uh, expand, you know, our prevention rates and our prevention work has, has you know, seen significant increase in performance. Now, because we're seeing so many people, more people through the door, it, I, I can see how looking at you, well, it's like we're running fast to stand still at the moment. 
What we can hopefully expect to see in the next few months is some significant impact from the new allocations policy. Again, that might seem a bit dry, new allocations policy, but what that does is enable us to take a, a kind of a, a, a more pragmatic look at people who've been in TA for a long time and make allocations based on those families that have been in there a long time. That will then have a knock-on effect, obviously, in terms of B&B. Um, but it will take a few months for that to flow through because as we make an allocation, it can be six, eight weeks by the time the void works are done and everything else before people are allocated. But I would expect to see a reduction in the numbers of families in B&B for over six weeks by around April time, things to start falling away. Subject to, of course, seven, eight hundred people walking through the door in in our in our um, in our homelessness um, centres. So, so, so basically, that those are the heads up on that. The the, the, the leads thing, and um, forgive me for for, uh, for making this project. I was actually chief officer in Leeds for um, for seven years. Um, Council Armour might be already be aware of that. I'm pretty familiar um, with um, you know the leads the leads approach. Um, and they have been, um, I think it's fair to say, pretty much recognised as, as as one of the leaders in this field for, for, for quite a while, actually, probably the last 15 years or so. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's lots of factors that contribute towards this. Um, it's not simple. Oh, they're just good at it. <laughs> um, there's lots of factors that are kind of the wind in their favour with certain certain things. But yes, they do see high levels of presentations, just like any other big city. What I would say, the, the big thing that I think we are getting right now and we are doing more of now that Leeds were doing a long time ago is their work with the private sector. So their work in terms of, you know, securing housing solutions, because we'd all love to have a council house for every, everyone that walks through the door. But unfortunately, we don't have that level of supply. I think everyone understands that. The work that Leeds did back in the noughties to develop their private sector engagement, their private sector offer, um, you know, using assured, short old tenancies as one of the first local authorities to really bring that to the party um, in the days of Louise Casey and the rest. Um, you know, that that really did get them ahead of the game. So, and their private sector uh, market is simpler. Uh, here in Birmingham, we have one or two few. Uh, one one or two landlords that have got you know like the small holdings of property um, in in Leeds and and uh, you know I'm a little bit out of tune so it might have changed a bit but I don't think it has that much. There are one or two really big players that if you engage with you know you're talking six seven hundred properties um, you know that that, that uh, they can actually command in terms of it. So there's there's some there's some different factors there but you, I suppose the point is we should be looking at others that do things. Um, that make their situation better than ours. And and um, whether it's Leeds or anywhere else, um, you know, the service and, and I am very open to working with others. Uh, so it, it's a point well made, a point to take on board. Um, Stephen will add more. The, the final thing I'll say, just in terms of um, the ombudsman issue. So um, as Mir has already said, um, you know, it, it couldn't be higher on the agenda for the directorate. Making, making sure that everything in the action plan, or as much as is humanly possible in the action plan, um, is delivered. You know, within the, within the time frame by April of this year, there are some factors that um, the ombudsman have, have highlighted that, that clearly relate to like IT development and single view of customer and stuff like that, which probably ninety five percent of the local authorities in the country haven't got and would love. It's a fair point, it, and, and it's on our list. But, you know, it's not something that they expect us to deliver, I'm sure, by April, or it's humanly possible to deliver by April. But anything that is, of course, we will be doing, um, we'll, we'll stay on top of that in terms of our delays. And then linked to that, the issues around compensation. One of the, thing that, uh, one of the things I asked the um, previous interim director to look, to look at, and, and Ash is very new to the party, so it would be unfair um, for me to uh, expect a response from here at this point was to look at the more use, more pr proactive use of arbitration. So uh, it, it, no single factor is an answer, you know, when it comes to disrepair and, and all that kind of thing. But I think arbitration panels that meet weekly can really help move forward some of those, some of those issues where we've got it wrong and it just makes sense to apologise and put it right 
get the repair right and compensate in some small way um, for our for our error. Doing that swiftly, doing it, you know, um, without delay is really important. Um, the longer these things go on, the better. So I'd I'd, I'd expect um, the team to to look at that in a lot more detail in the coming weeks. And I'll stop there. And if I can, if it's okay, I'll bring um, Asher in first, perhaps to talk about voids and, and Natalie if she wants to add anything from a management perspective. Asher. Well, um, yeah, beautiful summarised. Um, so there's, there's very little actually in terms of adding to the detail that Paul has um, just um, given the committee. Um, thank you through you, Chair. The point about the performance, we were actually improving performance between November and December. When we did the stats, we recognised that the number of working days in December brought the performance down. So operationally, there was actually a relative improvement. But because the supply chain closed and there's actually three and a half working weeks as opposed to four and a half working weeks, um, it just made it look, you know, look a little, a little lower. We're working with Fortem and, and you know, they're, they're the contractor who currently are having the issues with performance. I'm meeting with them every fortnight. Um, as Paul said, we've met with the directors and um, I've got a tracker with them literally every fortnight to ensure that they are currently improving their performance from now going forward. Um, over the next three weeks. So the committee has our absolute assurance that we are doing absolutely everything we can. Um, it's not as easy as, as, as just saying to them, you know, you've got to improve. They have got all of the issues with supply chain, with skills, labour shortage, etc. So we're trying to identify how best we can balance all of the mechanisms and issues that they've got we're proactively looking at the processes, Natalie and I are working together to make sure that we're proactive in terms of um, allocating the voids um, in, a, in, a, in a more positive and practical way. We're looking at our processes internally and I know Natalie will um, pick up on that. It's a, it's a plan that needs to give, be given the time to deliver. Um, we've only just enforced it at the 23rd of January and we have... Um, a commitment from Fortem that over the next three months they will start to deliver incremental improvements. And as Paul said, it's about the customer at the end of the day. There's a customer at the end of every property waiting for the keys. And we absolutely, you know, have reinforced that with Fortem every step of the way that you, you know, they may pay compensation, they may pay good health tax, they may pay um, void loss, but it's the customer experience at the end of the day and it's the person that needs a home. So, um, yeah, committee has some assurance that we are absolutely pulling out all the stops um, with regards to that. Could I just, through you, Chair, just make a point that Councillor and Councillor Rainbow made about damp and mould, if that's all right. Just to say, one of the things we're doing, we don't have a formal KPL on damp and mould. One of the things that I've talked to Mira and uh, my team about last week is about analysing the data on damp and mould in a more proactive manner. So we, we've started to put this in place literally last week to look at every repair that comes on a damp and mould basis identify proactive measures for those properties that have got more than three, four, five repairs and target proactive conversations with the customers, but similarly identify and linking with the decency programme. So behind the scenes, whilst it's not a formal KPI, there is activity taking place um, that we can assure the committee that you know we're, we're improving where we were six months ago. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. So Natalie, you want to add something? Um, um, Ash has gone over most of it. We've got a dedicated session on voids, which will give you an overview of the whole end to end voids review process that we're looking at um, and some of the activity that's taking place. That includes some void standards. Um, we are looking wider. I recently went to Dudley last week and had a look at some of their voids and how their teams are set up. Um, and we've also re looked at our KPIs and how we consider um, reporting those. We currently report on an average. Most areas report on routine and major, and we haven't got that breakdown at the moment. So we are doing a full analysis piece on that, but we've got a dedicated session for three hours, I think, at the next one, so we can bring all that detail there. But there is a huge focus on the, the work that we're doing, um, and we want to get it right. Thanks, Natalie. Any other member? Councillor Goodwin? Yeah, just a bit about down from Mark. <laughs> In Castlevale, I work very closely with Castlevale Community Housing, and they took this issue really, really seriously. They have some KPIs around this. I'm just wondering, maybe we should have KPIs. And perhaps, I hear what you're saying, but perhaps for me, I'd like to see a KPI presented which talks about the issue and down from so we know we're doing absolutely everything. For our, for our residents and our customers to do. It's not going to go away. 
And actually, I think for me, it would just be not just that we are doing stuff, that I've, I've got some data around that would really be helpful. If I can... Yes, Aisha. Okay. So, and basically, you're absolutely right. We will be putting something in place in the next contract. At the moment, we have a current contract with our repairs partners, and our repairs are measured um, in total. In totality. So we can extract the data from down the walls where data where we are where we are with the performance on those particular properties and those particular jobs. What we will be doing, um, and that we know that there is legislation coming through within the next few months from the government regarding damp and mould, and we're we're proactively going to be looking at that in advance of that legislation coming in to identify what measures we should be putting in place. Um, a future committee and cabinet potentially will be um, receiving a paper on a revised damp and mould policy. And within that revised damp and mould policy, we will be putting forward proposals for a revised KPI and indicators purely on those. Once we categorise them separately and we're able to uh, uh, get the customer to give us a problem, identify the fact it's damp and mould, triage it separately in our computer systems and put a measure on it, we're aware that certainly the government are intending to potentially put a far greater and more stringent timescale on completions of the on completion of those damp jobs. We are proactively going to try and go one step further on that and actually improve on the government's expectation um, of completion of those damp and mould jobs. So I'm probably preempting where we're coming in the next sort of three to four months to a future a future meeting. And Chair, yeah. it might be just worth reminding, sure, but just reminding to me see that. Um, prior to the very tragic death, um, you know, dump and mold cases were a category one repair, and you know, so they were treated as such. So therefore, had to be responded to within a 28-day period. Um, and and one of the things that we were able to do really quite quickly was to to identify, you know, that three quarters of our cases do get dealt with first time. That means quarter down. So they record a you know a a, a further visit. Um, so I think the information exists, and it, 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 it's, a, it's a tricky one. It, you know, it's not me saying we should, because we can monitor, of course we can, and we are monitoring. You can see that. We're de down to the, you know, specific number of cases that are coming through. But, for example, any a number of different repairs could contribute towards prevention in that, in that space. Anything through to electrical repairs and responding to electrical repairs on time, we could extract the fans that are failing, Will contribute towards damp and mould because we're not we're not seeing air circulation within that particular property. So, you know, we just need to be really careful that we're being comprehensive about that, but we're not recreating something that exists something somewhere else in terms of the process. So that's really important that we don't duplicate. Um, well, I agree with the, the non-duplication, yeah. but I just think it's a really really important issue. So. Some data about that would just be really, really helpful. And I appreciate this is going to go through cabinet and all of that. But just some, but while you're doing all of that, because I understand that's a process that will take time, so just for, for me to see something, because you know, like I can only compare apples with apples at this point. And when I work with my partners in Castle Vale, they're very clear about the number of cases they have, why that's been caused, what they're doing to rectify it how long that's taken, are there other factors that we don't know about around structure and all of that. Them sort of things I think are really important because what we want to be doing is protecting our customers and ensuring, and I, I'm no illusion whatsoever about this, that, you know, where we are, that we don't have another tragic circumstance in any way, shape or form. So and I want to make sure that information given to me yeah. as I'm sitting there actually means I'm sure that, that that's not going to be happening and not, not in six months or 12 months' time, we're in a conversation that says we're really, really sorry. Uh, we didn't react quick enough to that information because actually six and 12 months' time when we're talking about a tragedy again uh, isn't, isn't good enough for me. I want to know that actually we're on the case here and now and doing everything absolutely, but I'm seeing that data as well. Thanks, Councillor. I'm pretty sure, Councillor, that you know, within, within a week we've got that data in front of us. Okay. Um, you know, that what I'm just referring to there was was there. So that's not me saying it's all okay. We're all looking at the same things as housing providers right now. And what I wouldn't want Birmingham to do is is something a bit different to what was expected by you know the regulator and everything else. So we're you know we're not waiting for the guidance for six months to wait and see what the government would like to see. We we know today how many cases we've got, how quickly responded, and just to reassure we are monitoring. We are monitoring that regular rate going through to CLT. We can, 
suggest permission to bring back a specific report here again. Yeah. On damp and mould, be quite happy to do that. So it's not me saying it's all okay, but what we don't want is 250 different responses to the way we approach this from a monitoring perspective, because it, it won't help. It won't help ensure anything, you know, beyond beyond the work that's that's been done already. So with your agreement, I'm happy, new... happy to bring that back to the council and, and the committee at a later date. The new municipal year, yeah, we'd like to have one. Thank you. Councillor Lamba. Um, well, you mentioned the new applications policy. I just had a quick question around sort of how I suppose it's been communicated with uh, residents of the waiting uh, who are on the housing uh, waiting list. Um, I'm conscious of, I've had a few, couple of pieces of casework um, where, so there's one person in particular who's been on the housing waiting list for about four years now. Uh, in December, I think they were coming up to being like within the top 10 when they were bidding on properties. All of a sudden, they dropped and they were down to like 200. Um, they didn't know why the circumstances hadn't changed. So I was just wondering as if what help and advice was being given. Ben. So, they, so as you say, the new policy came into effect on the 18th of January and we've written to everybody uh, who's on the housing register um, in a number of tranches, but I think those all have gone out now. So everybody's received communication. Uh, for those sort of situations that you've just described, uh, that is the effects of the decision to uh, allow people who are homeless and in temporary accommodation now to be in band A. And so that means that uh, the households are in band A is a, a wider platform of households than it was previously. What that means is that households who have been in temporary accommodation for an extended period of time uh, also, when it comes down to the bidding and the uh, hierarchy in terms of where people are coming, are also in the same mix as the example that you've just given. And so in that situation, it will be about your citizen uh, uh, and what their circumstances are versus somebody who at the moment is homeless in temporary accommodation and has been there for an extended period of time. And so the decision that the council made was to recognise that the homeless pressures have to be balanced out against the other housing needs that we've got in the city and so that is the the actual effect of it um, that, as you say, we've had inquiries from people who, as you say, were seeing themselves relatively high in bidding, who are now finding themselves actually because they're in the mix with people who are, are homeless uh, and they find themselves lower down in terms of the bidding. Uh, there is an updated briefing note that uh, Councillor Thompson has that is going to go out to members to answer some of, you know, what's what are we seeing? Uh, what's the effect? And obviously, we as a service are monitoring very carefully uh, to make sure that the actual uh, strategy as far as the policy is being effective. So how many properties are being put out uh, through choice uh, each week and who is it that's coming through in terms of uh, opportunities for that? Um, it was the case uh, in the old policy that only around about 14% of people getting a home were homeless and that relates into the uh, Councillor Harmer's uh, questions about our numbers in temporary accommodation. We had to redress that to some degree, but obviously what we don't want to do is either produce a reason for people to come into temporary accommodation um, in that, right? So we have to make sure we balance those things out, but that's the effect that you're seeing. Yes, just, uh, <laughs> is anything being done to monitor the length of time people are on the housing waiting list? So, for instance, the particular person that I've talked about been on for four years she's now being pushed right back down so it's going to be a while longer until she properly gets a property is anything being done in terms of prioritization so if she's on the council the waiting list for 10 years say you know is anything being, being done to monitor that situation time counts and so uh, that matters uh, and yes we can see and we have the the business intelligence reporting to see how many period how long each household has been uh, on the uh, the waiting list uh, but it is a, a choice based uh, based upon an assessment uh, process and so therefore there will always be people who come onto it more recently than some who are on the list who find themselves at a higher need um, and that's the whole um, principle of it clearly then it also then comes down to how wide people are willing to look in terms of where they're bidding and also the nature of the property. If they're seeking a five bedroom house in a particular area of Birmingham, 
they could, you know, the, the statistics probably would predict them there on 20 years um, on the basis of the register at the moment. Um, if they're looking for anywhere in Birmingham and they're looking for a one bedroom, that would be a very different outcome in terms of that. And, you know, part of the new policy, again, allows people to think about whether they would, uh, even if they were a, could bid for a four bed, are they willing to think about actually a three bed if I can get it sooner is worth bidding for? And so, um, each time we put out the information um, on home choice about the status of the register, how many properties became available in the last quarter, um, and how many people were bidding for them, so people can understand where they they sit within that, um, and, and it's as transparent as we can make it. Anybody else? How much genuinely affordable housing can we access, whether it's our own, whether it's housing associations, nomination rights, whether it's the private sector? You know, what are the plans for the council to kind of in increase that genuine supply? It's a much, much, much bigger question. And, you know, we, you know, unfortunately, we've just been talking about, you know, the increasing levels of people presenting. So, um, you know, Again, at some future date, and it, it's a big wider piece. You know, Paul Kitson's directorate obviously are very focused on driving through supply and increasing supply. I think, you know, perhaps the committee would want to see how the council is is working with its partners to, to you know, to increase supply in the future. Thanks, Paul. Yes, it's a big question, and it's my 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 um, lack of knowledge or knowledge. So, for, for people who present themselves homeless. Is there any support to, to help with things like private renting with their kind of deposits and uh, first month's rent and all that? Because actually, if somebody says, you know, if, we, we, if you've only got 10 homes and 20 people, clearly there's a, there is, a, I get completely, there's a supply issue. Now, if there's plenty of private renting costs, things like Right Move and all these sites, if we can kind of match people and help with things like the deposit and the rents, Surely, that there's got to be something in that as well that helps. So, um, absolutely, part of the solution has to be the private rented sector. As Paul says, in Leeds, that is why they managed not to have temporary accommodation to any great extent. And we have an accommodation finding team, so I have 14 staff who all day, every day, are phoning landlords, looking at right move, looking at Zoopla, knocking on estate agents' doors, seeking to do deals with those landlords on behalf of homeless families, whether they're at the prevention stage, i.e. they're still at home, but they're going to be homeless within the next 56 days, or they're already in our temporary accommodation. It is a very hard job. So since uh, January, so the last year, they have achieved 170 family houses in the private rented sector for families that are homeless to move into. Now, one of the key components of that is the local housing allowance, which is the rate that you can get towards your rent from housing benefits. In Birmingham, our calculations are that only 7% of private lets are affordable to people who are on housing benefits. The vast majority of the people that are presenting to us are on housing benefits. And so on that basis, 93% of the private rental sector is unaffordable to those households. And so what our, my team is doing all the time is seeking to strike deals with private landlords to say, OK, your aspiration for the rent is this. They can only get this on, on housing benefits. How are we going to bridge that gap? What incentive can we give you to prevent this family being homeless? And so on average, our incentives are around about two and a half, three thousand pounds to the landlord for them to agree to sign up a family that's homeless and for us to be able to discharge duties so they're no longer homeless and for them to receive a two-year tenancy um, because that bit of the market is so much stacked against us. And different local authorities, London is more affordable in the private rented sector if you're on housing benefit than Birmingham. And so that is the, the battle that we're, we're facing at the moment in terms of that. That is also why we've seen, as Paul says, the uptick in the number of families becoming homeless out of the private rented sector. Landlords, their mortgage costs are going up, their insurance costs are going up. Also, standards that they have to rent to are going up for good reasons, but it's also a push why people are leaving that market. So 
we're absolutely doing that and we'll pay rent deposits, we'll pay um, guarantees, we'll we'll do all sorts of things to try and open that door um, to our homeless families. And it's something that we have to have to keep doing and more and more of. Is that on um, low, low, low incomes as well? Yes. Yeah, so if if you're on a on a wage, then it gives us a better incentive, a better opportunity. You know, it means we've got a little bit more to play with, and we will still absolutely work with them through the accommodation we'll planning team. Certainly. I think uh, we need to lobby the government because since this local housing allowance was introduced, the rents have more than doubled. So we need to uplift the the cap. Our calculations are the rent went up 17% in the last year and the local housing allowance is frozen and it's frozen next year as well. And so all that is happening at the moment is that the, the affordability gap is, is growing and it's making more people homeless and it's also making it harder for us to house people as well. Yeah. On, that, on that point, though, Councillor Thompson did remind us that, you know, parliamentary questions are important and, and uh, we're pushing forward as much as we can in that space to try and make the argument, you know, and another, we could quite lots of statistics here, but I think another key one, um, and um, committee members are probably already aware of this, but you know we were turning around seven thousand properties a year not so many years ago, um, you know as opposed to three and a half thousand now. Um, so you know we, you know, in terms of council allocations, that's roughly half, isn't it, where, where we were. Um, so it, you know, again, ideal situation, you know, we'd have that affordable rent. You know, or council rent, you know, or RP, but, but you know, that's not going to be the total solution, I'm afraid. We, we do need to keep working with the private rented sector, you know, driving up quality and standards and, 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 um, and trying to get, you know, it, a more def- affordable position by the LHA, as you say, Chair. Thanks, Board. This report is for noting. Is the report noted? Thank you very much. Next uh, agenda item is date of the next meeting, which is 16th of March. And agenda item nine is a request for call in stroke council call for action stroke petitions received and petitions. Nothing. Thank you. Number 10, other urgent business. No. And uh, finally, authority to chair and the officers in between the meetings. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, committee members and officers.